Okay, thank you, Brenda, for the introduction. So as part of the program, they were looking for a salinity type case study. Uh, it turns out it's kind of hard to find one of those that might not be tied up in litigation or they don't have, or that somebody doesn't want you talking about. Um, fortunately, I was able to reach out to a couple of clients that I work with uh, that were willing to let me talk about projects so long as names were excluded to protect the innocent. Um, so as Elise talked about, for those of you that were here last night, my friend Steve um, did some projects that I'm going to talk about today. Um, and just to kind of set the stage, when we're talking about uh, reclamation or restoration in general, um, you know, in the top left, I've got a, a pile of marbles. Um, we've got things of different sizes, different shapes, different colors, uh, different textures. So that could uh, be different different plants within a plant community, uh, different soil textures, different soil types, um, what have you. Um, and sometimes in uh, the process of reclamation or restoration, like the top right of black and white, sometimes we think in this black and white, it is or it isn't. Um, and with a disturbed system, a lot of times you throw all this in a blender and you just end up with a this gray. Um, and we have to figure out what what to do with that. Um, so thinking about soil specifically in saline soils, um, you know, we've got multiple different soil types across the United States, of different soil textures, soil odors, things like that. Um, some that are saline and some that are not saline, um, some that are saline sodic, some that are sodic. Um, and all of that is gonna kind of lead into, uh, you know, we need to know what we have uh, specifically on our site that we're that we're working with. Um, so a lot of people prior to me who are a lot smarter than me have given a lot of background information on soil salinity. Um, but this is, uh, so this is basically our textbook example of uh, whether a, a soil is saline or not. Um, for saline soils, we're looking at uh, ECs greater than four, um, uh, SAR less than 13 and a pH of less than 8.5. Um, and that's, um, and that's uh, kind of the, the basis of what I'm using as the definition for a saline soil throughout this presentation. Um, typically, uh, the, the way that we determine if it's a saline soil or not um, is through lab analysis. There are some field tests that we can do uh, to determine soil salinity but uh, typically the most uh, common and most reliable is gonna be through a lab analysis. So we might have, uh, when we're looking at a, a particular soil, we might, uh, there's varying degrees too, right? Um, so we might be slight to moderately saline, or we might have uh, an extremely saline soil um, and similar going the other way. Um, you know, we might be moving further away from having any uh, salinity issues in the soil. Uh, just quickly gonna uh, glaze over these uh, sources of salinity. We have naturally occurring sources, mineral weathering, uh, fossil salts comes from rain um, and capillary action, uh, moving groundwater up. Uh, anthropogenic sources or human caused sources, uh, irrigation water, fertilizers, uh, and then what we've talked quite a bit about today is industrial spills and leaks, uh, where we have uh, brine spills from uh, oil and gas facilities that could be uh, introducing uh, more salinity into the system. So, uh, again, looking at, we need to know, you know, kind of what type of soil we're dealing with. We need to have some sort of analysis to understand whether we're dealing with a saline soil or not, um, to be able to handle the soil that we have on our site appropriately. Um, so when we mix these soils all up uh, and disturb them through the process of construction uh, and get ready to put them back for reclamation, uh, ideally, it'd be nice to have all of our soil horizons uh, segregated like this so that we can put them back. Uh, that doesn't always happen, especially with uh, sites that might have been uh, constructed and disturbed 
uh, in the 50s, 60s, 70s, uh, when we weren't really paying attention to uh, topsoil salvage and the, the importance of that. Um, so a lot of times what we're dealing with, especially on older sites or ones where uh, you get a one size fits all uh, topsoil salvage or something like that, you might end up with this pretty uh, homogenous soil uh, matrix that you're dealing with. Um, and it's important to know the, the chemical and physical properties of that soil as well too. <clears throat> so just to kind of orient on a couple of examples, I didn't have any from North Dakota, um, but we're up here with the red star. I've got one example from Northern Wyoming in the Bighorn Basin. Uh, which is a very arid environment, um, which is kind of driving some of the, the salinity issues in that area. And then I've got another uh, uh, example from down in Colorado uh, on a pipeline uh, between Denver and Fort Collins. So starting in Wyoming, um, again, this is in the Bighorn Basin, um, very little precipitation, very arid environment, uh, which is likely driving a lot of the salinity issues that we're seeing in that area. Um, the photo on the right is from, I want to say May or June of last year. Uh, the, the brown in the background is, uh, kosher and Russian thistle. Uh, we have little to no vegetation establishment on this location. <clears throat> um, and the operator re reached out and asked, um, if, if we could help in determining what was going on here and maybe get some vegetation established. So, um, the history of the site, uh, it was abandoned in 2019. Uh, they did their final reclamation um, uh, with the seedbed prepped and seeded in the fall of 2019. <clears throat> like I mentioned, there was little to no vegetation establishment in 2022. Most of the vegetation establishment that we were seeing was around the edges of the, of the pad, so it was likely um, where we didn't have as much disturbance and might've had some more native uh, undisturbed soil uh, there that wasn't impacting the location. Um, unfortunately, uh, not everybody's great at keeping records. Um, so they didn't have uh, any initial reclamation plans or any documentation of what was done in 2019 uh, that was readily available. Um, so, my suggestion was, hey, go out and grab, let's go out and grab some soil samples uh, and see what uh, is going on on that location. Um, so we did that in July of 2022. Um, here are the results of that. Uh, Left-hand side, we've got the sample ID. So basically we went to the pad, uh, the north side of the pad, west and south. Um, all of these samples had little to no organic matter. Um, and one of them comes back with the textbook definition of a saline soil. Um, soils in the area uh, are fairly common to have salinity issues, uh, likely because of the arid climate, um, and then just uh, naturally occurring salts in the area. Um, so we looked at that um, again, Salinity isn't a, isn't a one size fits all. So, um, looking at this, I mean, it's it's a saline soil, but it's right at that where we call it saline. Um, so, you know, it it's not going to take as much to to get this uh, soil to be a little more uh, hospitable to vegetation establishment. Uh, as part of the lab. Uh, analysis that we did, we were able to get some agronomic uh, recommendations back on that. Um, you know, typically you're going to get an NPK uh, recommendation. So we got nitrogen, phosphorus, uh, they recommend gypsum, and then compost, which is going to be <clears throat> a big driver in uh, alleviating that soil salinity. Um, so then looking at uh, what, what's recommended for the three different samples across the top there, um, and then I just kind of took the average. Um, because this is a small kind of uh, small area, probably the size of this room, uh, it might make sense to go ahead and apply those uh, amendments 
across the entire site. Whereas if you're looking at a pipeline that's hundreds of miles long, uh, it's gonna be uh, more feasible to look at the areas where you actually need to do something. Um, I put the seed mix that was included in here, uh, mostly to point out that this is a BLM site and uh, this is the approved, the one approved seed mix for that area. Uh, so we didn't have any flexibility in changing the seeded species to maybe get something included that was a little more salt tolerant than some of the species in this mix. Um, so again, we need to consider whether the soil amendments should be made site-wide. I mean, with this well pad, um, the operator was gonna move forward with just treating it as one size fits all because none of the recommendations that uh, are making that we're making are going to uh, cause any harm. Uh, it's only gonna likely uh, cause greater success for vegetation establishment across the entire site. But if we were looking at larger disturbances or something like a pipeline, uh, it would probably be tailored to areas where it's specifically needed. Um, the seed mix wasn't easily adapted. Uh, and on this location, we can adjust the soil properties, uh, the soil chemistry to promote uh, vegetation establishment and survival. Um, so spoiler alert on both of these, we have not implemented any of the work or it has been implemented and I don't have results. So um, that's one unfortunate thing about this talk. Uh, we don't have results yet, but um, these are kind of some of the things that we were looking at and uh, the things that my friend Steve S. did that uh, led to us needing to kind of evaluate what has been done and what we can do to improve the situation. So now looking at the, at the site in Colorado, uh, again, like I said, it's between Denver and Fort Collins on a pipeline. <clears throat> the photo on the right shows what it looked like in August of 2022. Uh, you can see this pretty distinct uh, bare strip down the middle of that pipeline. Pretty much everything growing on the outsides of that is either white top or um, field bindweed. So we don't have ideal vegetation whatsoever. Um, and then looking even further out at the, at the area, there's still a lot of white top in the area, uh, very uh, little perennial grasses, desirable perennial grasses, um, as this was, it, it appears that it was a, a formerly used as a agricultural field at one point. So the site history of this pipeline was constructed in 2018. Uh, with final reclamation initiated immediately following uh, the, uh, the reclamation process of that pipeline, um, which if I'm remembering correctly was in the fall of 2018. Uh, the, the initial cost of the reclamation, I really don't know, um, especially considering just this small portion of the pipeline. Um, but this one, I kind of have some some dollar amounts that we can kind of look at and see uh, where maybe some better planning in the forefront might have saved some money in the long run. Uh, so in November of 2021, uh, there was a consultant uh, that went out uh, to look at the unsuccessful reclamation on a one and a half acre section of this pipeline right of way. Uh, they mowed the right of way, and I don't know if this is the order in which these things occurred, but it's the order in which they reported them. So that's uh, my understanding is that's my best understanding of the chronological order of these treatments. So they mowed the right of way, then sprayed the weeds, uh, applied the fer applied fertilizer, reseeded for a cost of. 8,600 bucks for uh, an acre and a half. Um, that doesn't include costs for inspections that led to this, uh, reclamation plans, uh, and anything that you know culminated in deciding the need for that work. Um, a couple of the questions that, that really came up to me when I was looking at what was done is the timing of things. Um, you know, if they mowed the right of way, and then sprayed the weeds, did they effectively remove the plant tissue that would have up would have taken in the herbicide to have the intended effect? 
Um, was there time between the the mowing and the spraying? Was there's there's all sorts of un, 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 unanswered questions there um, as far as timing. And then, as far as I can tell, they didn't do any soil sampling uh, to determine if there could be anything going on in the soil that would be limiting uh, the establishment of the desirable species. Another couple of complicating factors. So this is a closer view of, of the site. Um, and you can pretty easily see that bare strip of pipeline. Um, but surrounding the area, we have two irrigation channels. Uh, we also have a reservoir uh, directly adjacent. And to the north of the area in that yellow dashed line, um, that's what appears to be a former ear, like a flood irrigation ditch um, that probably is no longer being used. Um, so with this, we've got uh, groundwater uh, fairly close to the soil surface, uh, which then with, with the vegetation growth and the atmospheric uh, draw of, of water uh, from the soil, could potentially be leading to increasing the soil salinity by uh, through capillary action, bringing those salts uh, and other nutrients to the soil surface. Um, so, like I said, this is what it looked like in 2022. Pretty, very, extremely weedy and very little uh, establishment on that one strip. Um, we still have the vegeta vegetation establishment issues, <clears throat> all weeds. Um, we conducted the soil, we conducted additional soil sampling in December of 2022. Um, so one of the things that Dr. Gornish talked about last night was looking uh, at the fancy shiny things and overlooking the simple things. Well, around the time that I was asked about this, uh, this particular project I had uh, received and looked at uh, an advertisement from a lab on residual herbicide sampling. Um, so I was like, well, that's kind of cool. We should do that. Because maybe they tried to spray the weeds and they just, you know, nuked this soil. Um, but fortunately, we did also test for salts um, because that's one thing that was completely lacking in um, the pre the one previous lab test that I was able to find uh, was they tested for certain things. It looked like they went to a lab and selected a soils package, um, and it was more of a agronomic soil package rather than looking at some of the salt issues. Or um, it, I mean, I wasn't able to determine if it was a saline soil or not based on the results that they had received. Uh, so. The analytical results, uh, again, I kind of wasted some money. Uh, no residual herbicides whatsoever. None of, the, none of the ones that were tested for had a detect in the sample. Um, but we do have a little bit of a saline soil issue going on. Um, again, fairly close to that textbook uh, example of what soil salinity, what a saline soil is. Um, so something that, uh, we think can be addressed. Um, so the recommendations in moving forward is, uh, to, to get rid of, or to start managing the white top, uh, through, through weed spraying. And that's going to be a coordinated effort with the adjacent, the, the landowner as well. Um, because on either side of that pipeline right away, it's pretty solid white top as well. Uh, so they're, if they're only working on their uh, pipeline corridor, they're, they're just going to have an uphill battle uh, because they're not going to make any headway with, uh, without controlling um, on the neighboring land. Um, so this particular operator uh, didn't really want too much of an approach. They wanted it to be quick, easy, and simple. Uh, so the recommendation... Uh, 
that we're looking at is incorporating a source of mulch to increase uh, soil organic matter uh, in the top 12 to 18 inches of that soil and, and tilling that in to incorporate it um, at a rate of five tons per acre. Um, the one caveat I did throw on that is ensuring that the mulch does not contain additional salts. So sometimes uh, um, a mulch or a, an organic matter source that we might consider uh, could be cattle manure or something like that. It might have been stored uh, where water is uh, starting to impound, which uh, could lead to uh, accumulations of salt in that mulch material. Um, and if we're already dealing with a site that has salinity issues, we don't want to make it worse by adding uh, mulch that has additional salt in it. Uh, and then reseeding with a saline tolerant seed mix. So uh, the seed mix that was used uh, was provided by one of the uh, seed vendors down in Colorado. It looks like they uh, it's, it's a seed mix that that company uses uh, pretty regularly. Um, you know, and they, they basically looked at the seed, I mean, I'm guessing, looked at the seed catalog and we're like, oh, that was a, that's a good one. Um, but that seed vendor also has other seed mixes. Um, so the one that, that was used is a dryland pasture mix, pretty good mix of, uh, perennial grasses, um, pretty desirable, but that same seed vendor also has a saline mix. Um, so if we can use some species that are maybe a little more salt tolerant, a little more tolerant of those saline conditions, uh, you know, hopefully that'll increase the likelihood of success and establishment of vegetation on this site. So the 2023 plan, uh, like I said, this is all being implemented. Uh, as with any reclamation projects, we cross our fingers and pray for rain. Um, and hope that things go well. And we will probably evaluate this. Uh, we might do some additional soil sampling uh, a few months following the application of that, uh, the addition of organic matter to the soil, um, just to see if, if we're having any impact on the salinity of the soil. Uh, if not, um, you know, then we might reassess that. <clears throat> And then following uh, with the monitoring to see what, uh, see if our seeding is uh, going to be successful. Uh, so just some final thoughts that I have. Um, knowing the site history and previous activities can be really important. Um, knowing what sampling has been done, what's, what species have been seeded, um, have there been any soil amendments, uh, anything Anything like that can be really helpful in determining how to move forward. Um, sampling for the appropriate parameters. So uh, I believe it was Brenda mentioned this morning, um, you know, lab packages. Um, and I, I mentioned it in this one, the, the client had used a package from a lab, but it was tailored more towards an agronomic uh, standpoint, uh, which didn't really give us all the information that we needed to determine uh, whether it was uh, saline soil or not. Uh, so maybe spending a little bit of additional money up front on some additional sampling parameters uh, could could really give you some informative information. Um, and that's that kind of ties into the next one, selecting the appropriate lab analysis and reports. Um, again, looking at what information could we need in order to put this all back together. Um, and then the timing and the order of implementation of your treatments. So uh, thinking back to that Colorado pipeline, if, if they mowed off all the vegetation and then go out with a herbicide right after that, there's, especially if it's a contact herbicide, not a soil active herbicide, um, you've essentially moved the, removed the active site that is going to provide you any control. Um, and then taking care in selecting your treatment options for uh, soil amendments, uh, what type of amendment you're using, the source of that amendment, making sure that you're not increasing the problem, uh, evaluating the seed mix that you're using. Um, instead of a one size fits all seed mix, maybe looking at some of these areas that might potentially have salinity issues and tailoring a seed mix to 
those areas specifically. And then, um, you know, being uh, selective in the herbicides that we're using uh, to not damage our desirable species. Uh, and the list goes on and on. Um, but just careful consideration of everything that we're implementing to make sure that one thing's not counteracting the other. And um, we, we want the them all to be working together to improve our success. Uh, so kind of the, some, you know, lessons learned. Um, you know, the examples that I kind of gave, they, they started off by uh, doing some reclamation. Uh, they failed, so they went back and did some more reclamation. That didn't work out, so we go back and do some more reclamation. Maybe now we're in a stage where we'd you know, be decreasing the costs and some follow-up monitoring, a little mop up here and there. Um, but that can come out to equal some, some serious money. Uh, or uh, maybe we spend a little bit more money in, up front than we did over here, uh, do some additional sampling, spend a little bit more time uh, developing uh, different seed mixes um, and things like that. And hopefully our cost in reclamation would go down over time. Um, you know, we would, we would have a greater success up front. Uh, we might have a little bit of touch up or uh, follow up treatments that we need to do uh, and then monitoring, uh, which could result in a lower overall cost at the end. Um, so overall spending additional time and money up front could prevent the larger future costs. <clears throat> I'm sorry to disappoint with the complete lack of results, but uh, I do thank you for your time and attention. Um, if you have any questions, uh, here's my contact information. Feel free to reach out to me. Um, I'd be happy to help. And if I have time for questions, but people probably want to hit the road. So, oh, so the question is uh, on these saline areas, uh, how long after we're planting things are we seeing success from the seeded species? Um, on, on these ones, uh, to be determined, uh, there's been other sites and I'll give you the typical, uh, the typical answer. It depends, um, it, because it, I mean, it depends on all the environmental factors, precipitation, things like that. Um, probably the, the, the fastest one that I've seen really good success where you're getting a really, uh, good stand of vegetation was three years. Um, but there's been others where, you're, I mean, you're going back and, well, crap, it didn't work. So now what do we do? Um, and kind of reassess. And I mean, I don't even have an example of, of how long it could take. So the question was, do I know if there was any historical spills and did we measure chloride concentrations? Uh, spills, not that not that we're documented. Um, so especially, I mean, that one well pad up in Northern Wyoming, that was a really old well pad. Um, that was back in kind of the cowboy days of oil and gas uh, development uh, where things happened and then were just kind of kicked under the rug. Um, so that one, I really don't know. Um, the one in Colorado, I did reach out, um, and as far as I can tell, there was no spills in that area. Um, and then to answer your question about chlorides, they were tested for, um, but chlorides were not uh, of concern in any of these areas. You can look at removing any of the material. Question was, did we look at removing any of the material, disposing of it, and bringing in new material? Um, yes, uh, but the the two operators that, that we're dealing with, um, you know, and given the current economic client, climate of things, um, that just was not a viable option to them. They would rather uh, try, to, try to amend the soil rather than excavate and replace. And my question was, uh, what kind of compost was that on that first site? So, okay, so the question was, what kind of compost was it on the uh, oil and gas pad in Wyoming? Uh, that actually has not been applied as far as I know. Um, 
Unfortunately, there was some turnover within the company. I lost my contact. So um, barely, or we're just uh, now kind of figuring out what the status of these projects are uh, based on the, the recommendations that were made last fall. Um, because that's in the Bighorn Basin, uh, some of the, the recommended options were cattle manure from uh, maybe some of the feedlots in the area. Uh, it's sugar beet country. So uh, sugar beet pulp was one thing that we considered. Um, and there was one other, Brenda, and I can't remember what that was. It's in my head. Sugar beet pulp is a source of calcium. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so the question was, how do you address reclamation when there's weeds growing on your site, but they're also all around the site that you're working on as well? Um, well, first of all, that's a really unfortunate situation to be in. Um, but the biggest, the biggest success that I've seen in that is being cooperative with the owner of the property. Um, you know, like for this example, it was a pipeline. So it's going through their private property. Um, the operator is going to work with their land department to work with that landowner um, and propose that, hey, we will spray the weeds on your property out X amount of feet. Um, would you meet us in the middle and you know continue to control the weeds on the, the remainder of the property? Um, because if I go back, So many animations. Okay, if I go back, um, most of the white top actually occurred like not too far out. Um, and then you kind of started to get into some patches of really good perennial grasses. Um, so if, if the uh, oil and gas operator is willing to spray out 15 feet on either side of their right of way, and there's another 15 feet that the landowner can take care of, um, that's the the best way that it's going to be. Um, my answer would be cooperation and collaboration between stakeholders um, to increase the amount of area covered. <laughs> 